Every year, U.S. companies deliver tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons and defense systems to foreign clients. It is our government's job, via the departments of commerce and state, to ensure that such military technology does not fall into the wrong hands. This year, for the first time, the Controller General of the United States has designated the government's regulation of this deadly trade as a new high-risk area for U.S. national security. The agencies responsible for safeguarding our vital national security are now themselves a risk to that security. What is the reason for this sorry situation? The, the GAO has been pointing out the problems for nearly a decade. In report after report, it has noted that the state and commerce departments are in a state of denial about the need to adapt to new threats and new global technological challenges. These issues are particularly acute at the State Department, which has been awash in unprocessed applications for licenses to ship military equipment overseas, a whopping 10,000 of them at one point last fall. The State Department is beset by so-called managers who are in fact are unable to manage this process. Their recommendations throw more money at it. I certainly support increasing the resources at the State Department for this crucial job. It is absurd in the extreme that State has only 37 licensing officers to process nearly 70,000 applications, while Commerce boasts over 70 officers for a comparatively paltry workload of 23,000 licenses. But increased resources alone will not fix the problem of mismanagement. Simply put, the management of arms licensing needs the sustained attention and commitment by the senior leadership of the Department of State to fix the problem, a tension that has been lacking for several administrations. The Committee on Foreign Affairs will do its part in finding solutions with or without the administration's help. This hearing is an important part of that process. Let me be clear on two further points. First, I'm not an advocate of cutting corners on national security, either to boost exports or to reduce the long line built up at the arms licensing office. The recent treaty to exempt the United Kingdom from most arms licensing requirements may or may not be a good idea. The details of this treaty have yet to be worked out. I have long supported special consideration for our closest and most reliable ally. But these types of agreements are not a panacea for reducing states' licensing workload, which is increasing by more than 10% every year. Second, I will do everything in my power to preserve and expand congressional oversight over this process. I understand that the administration is preparing changes to both munitions and so-called dual-use licensing procedures. I strongly advise the administration to reflect on past experiences and to consult with Congress this time around, especially the Foreign Affairs Committees of the House and the Senate, before finalizing these changes. The executive branch must treat Congress as the co-equal partner in governments, in governance that the Constitution mandates we are. But if it refuses to do so, Congress will be forced to assert its authority by less friendly means. 
It is the administration's choice which path we take. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for coming to our uh, subcommittee hearing. And um, um, last Monday, um, the OPIC bill passed the full House. I want to commend uh, all the members of this subcommittee for all our hard work on that, and especially uh, thank uh, the chairman for, uh, for his efforts and for uh, his entrusting to this subcommittee the trade jurisdiction uh, of the full committee. And uh, I hope very much that these hearings will also lead to legislation. It may be a bit more difficult because we're not reauthorizing and thus it's not must pass legislation in the legislative sense of the term. But I think these hearings will illustrate that we have must pass legislation in the sense of making our government work better. The purpose of these hearings is to examine U.S. export controls. Uh, we must prevent the spread of uh, weapons and sensitive technologies uh, and to the wrong hands while at the same time allowing uh, defense trade with our allies and uh, non-defense items to go to all of our uh, trading partners. Our current export control policy was designed decades ago. Since then, technology has changed, the Cold War is over, and yet our export control reg regime remains pretty much unchanged. The regime resides in two key federal agencies. The first is the State Department's Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, DDTC. This agency licenses every U.S. purveyor of munitions, whether that uh, purveyor chooses to sell abroad or not, and then issues a license for every munitions export and even a separate license uh, for any follow-on contract for repair, maintenance, or whatever. Second, in the Department of Commerce, we have the Bureau of Industry Security, the uh, BIS, if you will, it, which uh, issues uh, licenses for the exports of certain items, uh, non-munitions but dual-use items, uh, to certain countries. It also affects every export of this country before, because before you export a paper clip, you have to think, is this a dual-use item? Fortunately, for the vast majority of exports, you can easily look on uh, BIS's website and realize you're not required to get a license. If we are too quick to issue the wrong licenses, bad people will get stuff they can use to blow us up. If that's the obvious side. But we should also be cognizant of what happens if we are too slow to approve the licenses we ought to approve. Obviously, we lose exports and jobs. We also lose revenue coming in to our high-tech and munitions companies, which they can use to spread the costs of research and development and keep America first in technology, which is so critical to our uh, national security. And if we're too slow to issue the right licenses, we hurt our allies and their ability to maintain their uh, militaries and their economy. And perhaps the greatest problem in not issuing the right licenses or not doing it quickly enough is we create a demand for the not made in America label. That is to say we cause customers around the world to provide the critical sales necessary to build defense industries in countries that do not share our national security concerns. We should begin by examining the growing number of export licenses that have been piling up at state Last year, the backlog of unprocessed licenses at DTTC reached 10,000, a number unheard of in prior years. The, Bure the uh, Bureau of Industry and Security over at Department of Commerce is not reporting the same problems, and the numbers uh, point to uh, the reason why. If you look back at uh, this chart, you'll notice that BIS processed 23,000 export control applications with a staff of 351 people. By contrast, DTTC, DDTC 
uh, processed, uh, as the chairman said, nearly 70,000 applications with a staff of 64 people. Moreover, the State Department's numbers show that license applications have grown at the rate of 8 percent or more uh, every year for the past four years. The chairman uh, cited the figure of 10 percent. But it's growing even faster now as the department expects to receive some 80,000 applications this fiscal year, a 23 percent increase from last fiscal year. There's been uh, some recognition of the problem, and I commend the State Department for taking the steps to streamline some of the paperwork through e electronic submission forms. Uh, but the median processing time for a license has doubled since 2002, and the agency continues to have trouble recruiting and retaining personnel, including senior management, and has some of the other problems that the chairman spoke of. Obviously, when you have a projective doubling of applications over the course of a decade and you don't have more staff, you raise the likelihood of two problems. First is the national security can suffer because not everyone who should uh, be applying for a license or required to apply for the license or investigate if they're not applying for a license um, gets the attention they deserve and also becomes it becomes increasingly easy uh, to violate the terms of licensing agreements. Second, you make it unnecessarily difficult, as I mentioned before, for U.S. businesses to supply our allies. One aspect of the problem is clear. There's simply not enough personnel to handle the problem, and the State Department, the administration, and Congress all must share some of this blame. The administration has not asked uh, for the money necessary to really get the job done on a timely basis. Uh, the State Department then raids the general account so that uh, DDTC doesn't get the money that Congress intends. Congress doesn't line item DDTC so as to prevent that raid. Uh, I see a fair number of lobbyists in this room uh, must share some of the blame for not using some of that lobbying muscle to solve some of these problems. And of course, uh, I share some of this blame since until we got trade jurisdiction in the subcommittee, I uh, had not spent a whole lot of time looking at these issues. Um, DTTC obviously needs a dedicated independent funding source. Uh, history has shown, as I mentioned, that the State Department cannot resist rating these funds for other functions. Um, one option for us as a subcommittee is to write the appropriators and urge them in conference to subdivide the general account and provide a specific line item for DDTC. But frankly, we need to look at other solutions uh, beyond that, including the possibility of a fee-generated source of revenue um, to add to the fee state is now getting uh, to make sure that we are not holding up billions of dollars for want of a few uh, personnel. We also face uh, turf battles between state and commerce, uh, as GAO uh, will note in their testimony. For example, commerce and state have not settled which agency has control over 47 missile-related items. There's an ongoing turf war over control of civi civil aviation equipment even though Congress specifically laid out in the Export Administration Act a provision that places a certified civilian aircraft parts and components under the jurisdiction of commerce. We'll be asking the State Department what part of the uh, EAA they don't understand uh, or uh, whether they think Congress uh, should amend it and uh, uh, revest that control in the State Department. I'm concerned that we are placing U.S. companies on a playing field dominated by confusion, needlessly uh, adding to our mammoth trade deficit and creating a perverse incentive, as I mentioned before, uh, to move development and, and uh, manufacturing of defense technologies overseas. The majority of our defense-related items go to longstanding allies of the United States. Sixty percent of our defense-related items are going to these seven countries, Japan by far the largest. Germany, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Canada, Italy, and Israel. These exports uh, do not consist of just tanks or aircraft or major items uh, that are physical, but also uh, contracts to maintain uh, as, and uh, train with and operate uh, the U.S. equipment and technology. Uh, we should carefully examine multiple options, including the establishment of guidelines uh, for average processing times and perhaps even more important, uh, to make sure that the 10 percent of the toughest cases do get uh, processed uh, in some expeditious manner. We should examine uh, the appropriateness of having the maintenance and service and training contract uh, be subject to a license that is can be applied for at the same time as uh, the export license 
that is to say applied for way in advance of when uh, that servicing is going and the repair work is going to be provided. Uh, and we should be looking at, uh, as I alluded to before, at the idea of uh, calling upon uh, the exporters to fund this system at a, uh, a, at a faster uh, level or a better staffed level uh, than we currently have. I realize that may not be the best approach because every other country tries to subsidize its exports, charging a fee to those who export um, is a second best solution, uh, but uh, it's certainly a lot better than uh, enormous delays uh, because that can kill a deal far more uh, than, a, uh, th th than a governmental fee. As the GA no a notes, neither Commerce nor State has made any fundamental updates to the export control systems in recent years. Each department has conducted ad hoc reviews that, unsurprisingly, determined there was no need to make any fundamental changes. However, I believe that fundamental changes will occur in the next few years. I'm eager to hear from all our witnesses how we can ensure that we are not needlessly blocking exports and inadvertently focusing uh, resources on technologies that are already easily available in the international market. And, and at the same time, I look forward to hearing uh, whether there are times when the current system is letting deadly technologies get into the wrong hands. Um, I thank uh, for his uh, patience, my ranking member, and recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we all recognize that our enemies are conspiring to hurt us in many, many ways. And we know that hostile governments, including Iran and terrorist organizations as well, are quite determined to acquire U.S. military technology. Frustrating their attempts to do that is an urgent responsibility. And this subcommittee has looked very closely at some real life examples of how that's been done in the past. And, and one case is the AQ Khan network. Uh, we've held a number of hearings uh, the last two years on this, and we've heard about that network's sophisticated attack on export controls worldwide, on how they used front companies, on how they used false documentation, on how AQ Khan and his people used diversion. And he ended up with the ability to sell the component parts to make an atom bomb. And frankly, um, if you were Libya or North Korea or Iran at the time, this was a network to put on your payroll or to uh, trade clandestinely, you know, technolo missile technology with. And that is what happened at the time. Now, we can be sure from looking at that example that others out there are using similar means in seeking technology, including American technology, to harm us. And this makes it critical that we have in place an effective export control system. Unfortunately, we're not at that point. The, the GAO has reported poor coordination between the Departments of State and Commerce as they control the export of military technology and dual-use items. There are persistent and problematic disputes over which export control lists particular items belong on. End-use monitoring, frankly, is weak in many cases. We know it's weak in the case of China. One expert had said, the safety net here is full of holes. Indeed, as we'll hear, the GAO has designated the effective protection of technology critical to national security as, in their words, cause of immediate concern. So I commend the chairman for calling this hearing. An, ex an effective export control system, while denying technology to those hostile, facilitates the export of technology that poses little threat. Our national defense relies upon our technological edge. Maintaining that edge in the face of increasing global competition requires vibrant manufacturers, which requires robust exports and coordination with foreign governments and foreign companies, which is also important to our joint military operations. At the State Department, the number of export licenses cases are up, many of which are increasingly complex. So while we may need to commit added resources to administrating our export controls, we have been upping those resources, filling more licensing positions. It would be more helpful to the system and reduce processing time 
which have reached an unacceptable numbers of days if key reforms were made resolving disputes over lists would be a start we don't want to drive american manufacturers offshore because of inefficient bureaucracies the a q con case also highlighted something else the fact that many other key exporters of military use technology have weak and shoddily enforced export controls in this case it was in europe while some progress has been made internationally the system is only as strong as the weakest country in this day of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction proliferation it's critical that we work with others to bolster their controls of dangerous technology to minimize the chances of it falling into the wrong hands this is a long term project which frankly i think on this subcommittee we should lead and so mr chairman again thank you for holding this hearing thank you mr royce let me now recognize the vice chair of this uh, subcommittee mr uh, scott thank you mr uh Mr. Chairman, and uh, certainly welcome our distinguished panelists. We're certainly looking forward to your your, your discussions. Um, this is very, very important, our U.S. export control system. Um, and uh, as you may know, I represent uh, one of the largest and certainly the finest aerospace defense technology companies in the nation, certainly in the world. And that's Lockheed Martin uh, in Marietta, Georgia, in my, my district. So, and, and as such, the concerns of the industry certainly weigh heavily on my thinking on this issue. But that being said, um, I understand the need to keep a close watch on the items we export and to where we export them. In an age of rapid technology development and with the numbers of dual use items skyrocketing, we must keep items that can be turned into weapons out of the hands of potential terrorists who want desperately to kill us and destroy our way of life. That is the delicate balance that we face now, and that is why this hearing is so critical. Uh, with that in mind, it is also important that we do not severely restrict the ability of industries to do business in a free market way. That also is extraordinarily critical. And I am concerned that any move toward a user fee to process a license might do just that. Any user fee would only create additional barriers to doing legitimate business and would almost certainly shut small companies out of the process altogether, and that we must not do, as these fees would be on top of already large registration fees. Registration fees, which just recently tripled to almost $1,800. Moreover, I feel that a fee for service system has the potential of tremendous corruption. We're all, we've all heard the horror stories about corruption in the user fee system of the FDA for drug approval. And with scientists and regulators being in the pocket of pharmaceutical manufacturers. That is precisely the type of situation we definitely want to avoid. It would make more sense, it seems to me, to reduce the number of licenses a company has to apply for and eliminate duplicative paperwork and registration requirements for simple things like just change in a company's name. As my time is running short, I will summarize by simply saying this. As we proceed in developing much needed reforms to the U.S. export control system, it is important that we proceed carefully uh, with, with, with well thought out analysis and in a calculated way with all the players at the table, both industry and government, to find a mutually agreeable solution. And finally, 
one fundamental issue that I hope we get into today is this, that the degree that licensing delays and the increasing backlog of pending applications, we need to determine what their impact is on the management of defense programs <coughs> with our key allies and partners around the world. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the uh, Vice Chairman. I'll just uh, comment that uh, any user fee is at best a second best solution, and as the gentleman from Georgia points out, may be fraught with other problems. One problem with the existing registration fee, it is one flat rate for large and small companies, and certainly uh, any uh, fees that come out of this subcommittee this year should be somehow a percentage of the sale, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the sale, if we did anything at all, and certainly not a flat rate fee uh, where the huge company and the small are paying the same amount. Uh, knowing uh, the, of his advocacy for small business on this point and every other, I recognize uh, if he has an opening statement, uh, the uh, former chair of the uh, Small Business Committee, uh, Mr. Manzullo. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing on export controls and their impact on U.S. export control policy and the impact on U.S. national security and economic competitiveness. As many of you know, I formed the Export Control Working Group with my distinguished colleagues Joel Crawley and Earl Blumenauer at the beginning of this Congress because I was and I'm still concerned that our Cold War era export control system is not working as envisioned. While I could and would like to speak more broadly about my concerns with our current system, I'm going to focus my remarks on the area of greatest opportunity for improvement, defense trade license processing by the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, DDTC. I'm concerned that such an important function has, has historically <coughs> received so little attention by the Department of State. The fundamental changes are necessary in processing licenses if our government is to fulfill its core mission of promoting U.S. national security and foreign policy interests without sacrificing the defense industrial base and America's competitiveness. These concepts are not mutually exclusive. I'm not concerned about the number of licenses that are approved or not approved. My concerns are about the length of time it takes to process those licenses. If our allies in Europe are able to process licenses in one or two weeks, why does it take us five to ten times longer? I understand that DDTC is working overtime to minimize the time it takes to process license application, but more is necessary. Last year, there was a backlog of 10,000 licenses waiting to be processed by DDTC. It's my understanding that licensing officers work day and night and through the weekends to reduce the backlog down to 5,000 pending licenses which is still uh, unacceptable. And now the backlog is back up to 7,000 licenses. Either the program is underfunded or major programmatic changes are necessary. I personally believe it's both. Currently, license processing can be so slow and burdensome that U.S. suppliers are denied access to international trade opportunities because they have been seen as unreliable suppliers. Those are the losses that we can never set a dollar figure on. Also, I'm concerned that scarce resources could be applied to low-risk areas with particular items, uh, with items of particular sensitivity not receiving appropriate attention. Some of you may be wondering about the low-risk areas I'm maybe referring to. One category that readily comes to mind is civil aircraft parts and components that have been certified by the Federal Aviation Administration. Aerospace manufacturers in the Northern, Al Northern Illinois Congressional District I'm proud to represent have stated that DDTC has not applied 17C of the Export Administration Act consistently. I want testimony on that. This provision explicitly states that all previously certified aircraft parts and components belong under the jurisdiction of the Department of Commerce. I'll be interested in hearing from Mr. Padilla and Ambassador Mulp regarding the Department of State's justification for not applying 17C and therefore not following the law as intended. This is just one example of the confusion associated with following the International Trafficking and Arms Regulations, ITAR, 
particularly for small manufacturers who don't have the resources to hire export compliance departments. There are many others. This lack of clarity can lead to incomplete application that can further overburden the licensing system. Let me give an example of the problem. This connecting cable is ITAR regulated. This one is not. The one on the left is the good guy. This is the bad guy. The bad guy is one inch shorter than the good guy. Now, there's got to be a way to export these things without going for a license. These are two fasteners. The one on the right is ITAR regulated. The one on the left is not ITAR regulated. It's not even on the CCL list. Now, this is absurd. This is why you have so many licenses. This is why there has to be a complete reorganization and restructuring of the system by which American manufacturers could be competitive. Because if our guys have to go through all the licensing to sell this, foreign buyers will say, I can get that somewhere else. In fact, we see today advertised, ITAR free, come buy from us, US is crazy. <laughs> and we're doing it to ourselves. And so something's got to be done. Because I have a lot of manufacturing jobs in my district, and I just lost another plant yesterday. And as we become more and more recognized in the world as an unreliable supplier, people in Washington just look at each other and say, you know, we got to do something about this licensing problem. Well, I want some answers today as to why this, if it falls into the hands of the enemy, I guess it could have been in prison, so I better put this in here and so nobody comes around. But if this falls in the hands of somebody else, I guess I'm okay on that. But that's the position that American manufacturers find themselves, especially the little guys, especially the little guys out there who make quality products and can't hire people to be able to go through the weeds involved in export controls. We've got some real enemies out there. But one of the biggest enemies lies with all, within all these regulations so that the people who made this country with their hands the manufacturers are becoming so frustrated, some may just give up, and many have, and set up shop in Europe and in Asia. And so I look forward to the testimony. I would also trust that the second panel would stick around, and I'll be watching to see if you do, to listen to the second panel of people who experience <laughs> the real live angst and griefs, including the GAO people who I wish were seated with this first panel, so that GAO accountants could confront the people in the other agencies directly as to the inefficiencies involved, and I look forward to the testimony. Thank you for overcoming your shyness. And <laughs> uh, I also do want to point out the, the Export Administration Act, which both Mr. Manzullo and I cited, of course, uh, has been allowed to lapse by a Congress, but it's being kept in effect by executive order. And uh, the provisions that we both cited on civilian aircraft, I believe, are still in force through executive order. With that, let me check with the gentleman from Colorado who uh, does not have an, the best opening statement of any of us. <laughs> um, we have before us three agencies. I've mentioned uh, two. We all have mentioned two. But the third is the Department of Defense, which plays uh, a role in, a, 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 I guess, a more modest role, such a modest role that I haven't heard any criticism of the role of the Department of Defense. I'll point out that there are, I, as we was talked about, turf battles, and I wouldn't want to give the you know, President any advice, uh, but I would hope that you both work for the President, that he would get somebody in there as a referee to deal with these turf battles and one department that has the qualifications to do that is the Department of Defense. But frankly, uh, however the President wants to carry out his you know, to, to deal with these turf battles, he ought to be doing so. So let me uh, introduce the woman from the not yet criticized agency, the Department of Defense, Mrs. Beth McCormick, Acting Director of the Defense Technology Security Administration. Uh, in this capacity, uh, she is responsible for developing and implementing DOD technology security policies for international transfers of defense-related goods, services, and technologies. Mrs. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to talk about um, my role uh, in leading my agency and the Department of Defense's role in export control. Um, simply stated, the role of the Department of Defense in this regard is really to support uh, the two agencies represented to my right, the Departments of State and the Department of Commerce. But I think my agency and the Department of Defense uh, possess some unique capabilities to provide um, technical expertise, uh, to develop and validate coalition and interoperability requirements, and to provide program insight, which is necessary to uh, ensure export controls protect U.S. national security interests while at the same time facilitating exports and trade. And that's an important balance that we all have to do in the job that we perform. The ultimate goal for the Department of Defense in this regard uh, and in this process is to really protect the U.S. warfighter and the coalition forces that also join us in military operations. Within the Department of Defense, uh, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy uh, has delegated uh, to the Defense Technology Security Administration this responsibility. And a couple of years ago, when we had a new charter for my organization signed, which was signed back in 2005, we had a new set of responsibility laid out, and I think they are a really good set of responsibilities that my agency is charged with. The first one is to preserve critical U.S. militarily technological advantages. This is obviously very important because as we f go on the battlefield, we want to make sure that our forces and our coalition forces have the best equipment uh, to fight the enemy that we, that we face. Secondly, we need to support legitimate defense cooperation with foreign friends and allies. Um, because obviously having similar equipment and working with people who are fighting with us and alongside with us in the global war on terrorism is incredibly important. Third, it's important that we assure the health of the indu defense industrial base. And fourth, uh, we need to pre pre prevent proliferation and diversion of technology that could prove detrimental to U.S. national security. So that, those goals of my agency, I think uh, it sort of shows the different balance that we have to do every day, and I take very seriously the fact that I have to try to meet each one of them Sometimes there's a little inherent tension in them, but we need to do our best job to balance those, those, those goals. My agency's contribution to technology protection really comes at two ends of the export control process. First, uh, through um, our, our participation in making recommendations to the Department of State and Commerce on what our position about licenses should be. And also through continuous work uh, on both national and international uh, regimes. And this is an area, particularly on the international regime front, that I think is very important uh, because it's important that we work with other countries to make sure that we have a, a sort of a similar, at least a harmonized approach to uh, export controls because obviously uh, individuals out there are going to acquire technology where they can. So it's very important that we do that. It's also important, obviously, to ensure that our industry is operating on a level playing field. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be here, uh, and I look forward to um, working with this committee uh, in discussing this matter because I think it's an area where it's important that we have a very constructive dialogue between uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for pointing out that when we do make a good export of military goods, not only do we make our allies stronger, but we make them interoperable with us and with each other. Um, as I move to the second panelist uh, uh, on our first panel, let me point out that we're going to combine the second and third panels in order to try to get through by not too much after 4 p.m. today. With uh, that, let's move to Ambassador uh, Stephen Mull. He's Acting Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. He's a career Foreign Service officer who has served as U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania. Mr. Mull, uh, Ambassador Mull. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to you and to all the committee for giving us the opportunity to come down to this group and talk about this uh, critically important uh, topic. My Bureau's most important job is to manage the export of our nation's most sensitive technology and equipment in a way that both protects America's national security interests and our military preeminence, but also ensures a rapid military supply to our allies, partners, and defending our common interests around the world but also supporting America's industrial base and economic prosperity. Now, this is a very fine and difficult line to walk because these goals are often in uh, opposition to one another. And I'm proud to do this job, to walk this line with a tremendous team of colleagues at the Director of the Defense Trade Control. They're an extraordinary group of people, drawn from the ranks of the Civil Service and Foreign Service, as well as some active duty military officers whom the Defense Department lends to us to uh, help carry out this uh, job. Jammed into crowded, uh, overcrowded uh, uh, cubicles, 
This team of patriots worked very long hours to do what's best to protect and promote America's interests. And I think they have a pretty good record of success. Our team has flagged the illegal diversion of sensitive night vision equipment, Black Hawk helicopter engines, and unmanned aerial vehicle technology to potential adversaries around the world. And we've supported very successful criminal prosecution of these cases. But despite this proud record, when I became acting assistant secretary earlier this year, it was very clear to me that our operation faced enormous and growing challenges, and that continues to be true today. Those challenges include, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, as well as others, a rapidly escalating caseload, both in numbers and in complexity, combined with years of operating within a very tight fiscal environment. And that has contributed to a significant increase in, to my standard, an unacceptable length of processing time in each of these cases. This increased workload has also cramped our ability to adjudicate disputes over commodity jurisdiction sufficiently quickly to assist U.S. businesses in their planning. We've also had software problems in attempting to computerize our operation. Those problems have significantly delayed the new efficiency that we'd hoped to achieve by now. We faced gaps in directing senior management with the departure of one official for service uh, in Afghanistan and the retirement of another. And also, as you all know, the Government Accountability Office has identified the issue of export control of sensitive technology as a high-risk vulnerability for the United States. Now, in developing a strategy to respond to these mushrooming challenges, my colleagues and I have undertaken a number of measures. First, and this may sound odd coming from the lips of a government official, but we warmly welcomed a GAO investigation uh, into our operation earlier this year. And we very much look forward to benefiting from the thoughtful insights and advice that I expect uh, Ms. Calvares and Bard to provide uh, in, the, uh, in the next panel. Uh, internally, I also invited a team of State Department management experts who are veterans, well-respected, to study our operations and to make recommendations on how we can improve our management. Further, the Director of Senior Management is surveying other licensing operations in the U.S. government for best practices, and we've already greatly benefited from studying uh, the performance operations at the Defense Technology Security Administration. I've also asked my staff to begin work with the Office of Management and Budget on the possibility of using OMB's program assessment rating tool as a means of systematically addressing how we can best improve. In the meantime, we've begun implementing a number of measures that I think will significantly improve our ability to protect America's security in a more transparent, a more efficient, and a more customer-friendly way. And by the way, I want to extend my appreciation to the Coalition for Security and Competitiveness for its constructive suggestions, which have greatly helped us in our internal review. These are the measures that we are in the process of implementing now. We're set to introduce a case management review mechanism that will immediately identify high priority cases for expedited handling and reject those at the start of the process that pose a clear threat if approved to American security interests. Second, we will implement benchmarks for our case management process to adjudicate cases within 45 days, with exceptions for national security or congressional notification requirements. Third, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense Trade Control will immediately and personally review any case related to military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq that is not completed within seven days. Fourth, we will fix the software, we are about to fix the software to bring our new system online and that will be up and running in October and I'm very confident that will immediately lead to increased efficiency. Fifth, we will work with our colleagues in the Commerce and Defense Department to institute a more efficient jurisdictional dispute mechanism that will meet established deadlines. And finally, we will continue to update our policy to reflect the changes that are underway in the global economy. Notably, we'll initiate a policy change to authorize employees of foreign companies who are nationals of NATO and EU countries, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, to operate within the terms of the license without having to go through further red tape and additional documentation. We also hope that we will diminish our licensing workload and improve efficiency with the Senate's ratification of the Treaty President Bush recently signed with Prime Minister Blair on defense cooperation with the United Kingdom. Finally, I want to pay special tribute to the extremely valuable partnership of the Congress in managing export control, particularly this committee's talented staff, whose insights greatly inform and insist our work. In the months ahead, we hope to work with you in exploring such ideas as alternative financing mechanisms for our operations and whether we can work together to make the notification process more efficient and more transparent for both sides. 
As I mentioned, we have a tough job in balancing America's security, alliance, and commercial interests, and the American people have the right to expect the very best efforts in responding to that challenge. With Congress's help, I pledge to you that's exactly what we'll do. I look forward to answering your questions specifically about the ICAR uh, issue that uh, Congressman Mantulo raised, as well as the uh, DAA uh, item about the aircraft. Thank you. Ambassador Mull, it's not always a wildly fun experience for a State Department official whose office has a huge backlog to come testify before our committee. Just thank God you're not involved with passports. <laughs> I do every day. <laughs> um, finally, we have the Honorable Christopher A. Padilla, the Assistant uh, Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration. He is responsible for developing and implementing U.S. policies governing the export of items controlled uh, for national security, foreign policy, and nonproliferation uh, reasons, uh, except for, of course, those items uh, subject to the State Department. Uh, Mr. Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Royce, members of the subcommittee, we very much welcome your interest in this topic. Uh, your hearing today asks an important question. Do our export controls uh, protect our security while facilitating exports? And I believe that the answer is yes. And I'm pleased to explain the Commerce Department's role in that process. Uh, the Commerce Department is responsible for the control of the export of dual-use goods, which are those that are primarily for civilian uses, but that could be used for military purposes. Now, a prime example of that is, is this product, which is a triggered spark gap. Uh, it looks like an oversized spool of thread that used to go on my mother's old sewing machine. Uh, in fact, it is a high-speed electrical switch uh, capable of generating uh, synchronized, uh, very high-voltage electronic pulses. It can be used uh, and is used in medical devices to help break up kidney stones. It can also be used to detonate nuclear weapons. The Commerce Department's role in controlling the export of products like this is primarily implemented through a licensing system. And in fiscal year 2006, we processed nearly 19,000 export licenses and an additional 4,700 requests for commodity classification, valued at $36 billion. That's the highest number of applications that we've reviewed in over a decade. Nearly all of those applications were referred for review to the Departments of State, Defense, in some cases the Department of Energy, and the intelligence community for review. But even with all this careful review, we are reaching, I believe, in the Commerce Department system, new heights of efficiency. Through June 30th of this year, the average license processing time has dropped from 34 days, which we had in the last fiscal year on your chart, to 29 days. And we certainly hope to maintain the 29 or 30 days uh, at the conclusion of this fiscal year. That's down from 40 days in fiscal 2001. So while the number of export license applications at the Commerce Department is up 74% since the beginning of the Bush administration, our processing time on average is down 28%. And I think, Mr. Chairman, if you ask the exporting community, uh, you would find that the opinion of our process is that it generally is adequately staffed, that it works with relative efficiency, a clear dispute resolution process, and a focus on customer service through extensive training programs and online services. But although the dual-use system, I think, operates reasonably effectively, it was designed for the Cold War, as Mr. Manzullo said, and it does need updating. It needs to deal with several new challenges. First, we need to focus our controls not just on countries of concern, but now also on customers of concern. And that's because terrorists and proliferators don't operate conveniently within the borders of certain countries, they operate across borders. And export controls focused on customers of concern will help us keep dangerous products out of their hands. Another challenge we face is that our relationship with emerging powers is not as simple or black and white as our relationship was with the Soviet Union. And there is no better example of this than China, which is neither our adversary nor our ally. And to reflect this, our export controls on China seek to permit legitimate civilian trade while prudently hedging against the uncertainties of a significant Chinese military expansion. In response to these challenges, the Commerce Department is making a number of changes. First, we're moving away from looking only at countries of concern toward customers of concern. And to do that, we have to tell exporters more about who the good guys and the bad guys are. 
We're doing that through things like the validated end user program, which will tell customer or tell exporters who the trusted customers are in certain countries. And we're also expanding our entity list, which is our bad guy list, uh, uh, and expanding our ability to put companies on there if they're engaged in terrorism-related activities or conventional arms proliferation. We also need to continue to make improvements in our licensing process. We recently developed and uh, deployed a simplified online export application system so that now everything can be submitted electronically. In fact, we are about to completely phase out paper-based licensing at the Commerce Department. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we need to make sure that controls keep up with technology. An excellent example uh, I brought with me today uh, are these thermal imaging cameras. Uh, these cameras uh, take a, a thermal image of whatever you point them at. Uh, this one seems to be reading only red at the moment. Uh, that's because the cap is on my able <laughs> And I can see Ambassador Mull here. He's, he's looking relatively warm. <laughs> we will monitor his temperature through the hearings. Now, and whichever <laughs> member of Congress creates the highest temperature gets the award yes, for today. I'll pointed at myself. This is uh, a product that actually is, is a commercial product. Um, these are used in things like firefighting uh, to look for fires in buildings. They're, they're used in search and rescue to search for children lost in the woods. Uh, they're used in preventative maintenance. You point them at a boiler to see where the steam might be leaking. Um, and yet this product requires a license from the Commerce Department to go to any country virtually in the world. Uh, we, we export these principally to Europe, Japan, and Australia. We issue more licenses in every year from the Commerce Department for this commodity than for any other single item on the Commerce Control List. And yet, this camera, which also has the lens cap on, <laughs> does the same thing, made in China, with French parts and components, and it has the same, actually slightly more advanced technological capability than this one. Chinese product can go anywhere in the world without a license, we're issuing about 2,500 licenses a year for this one. We know, Mr. Chairman, that that's a control that needs to be updated. And I can say that we have agreed among agencies that controls on these types of very low-level cameras do need to be updated. Now we're working to finalize how we do that without releasing higher-level technology that could be used by terrorists as night vision goggles. So to sum up, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is not easy. It's an exercise in drawing lines. We could certainly use a renewed Export Administration Act in helping us to draw those lines and bringing clarity to things like the control of civil aircraft. We welcome the recent recommendations of the Industry Coalition on Security and Competitiveness. We appreciate the Export Control Working Group with Mr. Manzullo, Mr. Crowley, Mr. Blumenauer. I've met with them a couple of times. The task is complex, but I believe working with Congress, we can continue to update our controls to meet the security needs of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. I know that uh, Ambassador Mull has pointed out that he's seeking outside advice. He uh, has got it from a number of sources. He ought to get advice from you, Mr. Padilla, as to how you got three times the budget. <laughs> and if you give him that advice, he'll be very grateful. Uh, I'm going to do the my questioning last and turn it over for questioning to Mr. Royce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I remember back in 2004, registration free fees were tripled. And I wanted to just check and see what happened to licensing processing time as a result. I think the fees went up at the time from, from sixteen hundred dollars to fourteen hundred and some dollars, six hundred dollars to fourteen hundred and some dollars. Uh, or was it seventeen fifty? What was the the consequence in, in licensing uh, processing time as a as a consequence of that? Uh, well, over uh, that period, uh, our price, our license fees and processing time has uh, has increased as Mr. Chairman has specifically shown. So the bulk of the money that uh, has been put, uh, has been gained from the uh, increase in licensing fees, we did put into uh, some infrastructural investments to develop a, a, a computerized so we can move to a paperless uh, licensing uh, operation. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we have had some um, development problems with our uh, stuff that we will have resolved by uh, October, but uh, yeah, I, I think processing time has gone up. I think it's one of the most critical questions is doing this in real time, to quick turnaround, and 
getting from you exactly what we can do to make for sure that happens. I think another question, uh, the International Relations Committee report that we had in 2004 suggested that the administration then was working on a grand bargain uh, with other countries in which we relax some of the export controls that we're talking about here in exchange for them tightening theirs. And I wondered what type of focus and results came from that effort, where we stand today vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, that concept. Uh, the effort in 2004 uh, we had to shelve because of uh, opposition within the Congress uh, at, the, uh, at, at the time. Uh, we do have a number of uh, initiatives underway to work with our partners around the world. Uh, one of the most significant ones is the proliferation security initiative, which over 80 countries uh, have now signed up and work with these countries in making sure that we have uniform and strict uh, export control uh, in place. Uh, in every foreign trip I make in this job, uh, it's a topic that I regularly discuss. Uh, we work at providing uh, technical assistance to those countries that, uh, uh, that require it. Uh, we need to do better, and it, it remains a uh, continuing high priority. <laughs> We might want to look at re-raising that, that bargain, given the circumstances we find ourselves in today. I was going to ask Mr. Padilla, uh, the GAO report says that uh, China, for example, along with some other countries, limit the U.S. government's access to facilities where dual-use items are shipped. Now, I, I don't know how you do enforcement, given uh, that lack of access, and I would ask you how you respond on that point. We have a, a continuing dialogue with the Chinese and, and an agreement with the Chinese uh, that allows us to conduct uh, end-use visits in China. Um, and we conducted, I believe, about 35 such visits last year. Uh, we have uh, an export control attache at our embassy in Beijing. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at finding additional resources to, uh, to provide more help to that person uh, because that is a, an important aspect of building trust. Uh, what we have explained to the Chinese is that for certain very sensitive items, if we're not able to do an end-use visit, we won't issue a license for the product. Okay. So if the Chinese will work with us uh, to provide access to certain of these facilities, then we could possibly consider those licenses, and that's uh, been our basic approach. And I did want to ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Padilla, on that point, too. You mentioned in your testimony that the intelligence community provides critical information on these end users. Yes. And I think uh, maybe within the parameters of what's uh, appropriate here, it might be help you helpful if you tell us a little bit more about the strengths and weaknesses of that process, um, whether you have enough resources to monitor end, end usage of dual use technology. I think it'd be very important to us to know that. Uh, and uh, to me, I'd, I'd like to know the extent of the violations you uncover because uh, Ambassador Mole reported a little bit about the extent of that problem in China. So, Mr. Padilla. Well, thank you, Mr. Royce. The, as we move more toward a system that focuses on individual customers of concern, not just countries of concern, as I mentioned, it will be vital for the intelligence community to play a key role in that, in telling us about who the trusted and not so trusted customers are. Uh, we have had a good relationship with the intelligence community. Uh, they review upwards of 85 percent of all the licenses we receive. Uh, Mr. Padilla, if I could ask all witnesses to speak into the microphone. We're able to hear you in this room, but there's an overflow room that's also listening. And, all right. Uh, they need to hear you loud I and hope clear. That, I hope that works a little better. Uh, well, I, I, but some of, uh, certainly some of this is done with Chinese government involvement, and I think that's the part that really Yes. compounds the problem here vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the we need more help from the intelligence community, not less. We have had, uh, my colleagues and I, a vigorous discussion with our colleagues at DNI to urge them to devote the resources necessary to this critical function because otherwise our licensing officers in both agencies would be flying blind. And ultimately, Iran was the most active customer in the international black market, at least according to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, would you agree with that conclusion? And how, lastly, how closely focused are you on denying Iran uh, sensitive technology, given them coming out number one in terms of yes. uh, proliferation? Uh, Iran, Iran is, a, is a major source uh, of concern with regard to illegally transshipped goods. Uh, I don't know if they're the number one in terms of enforcement. We have a total embargo on Iran, which is actually maintained by the Treasury Department. 
Uh, and we vigorously, however, in, in the Commerce Department enforce uh, that embargo on Iran, whether it's uh, for uh, commercial aircraft or the uh, transshipment of parts that could be used for IEDs uh, being sent through uh, transshipment points like Dubai. Thank you, Mr. Patia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me now recognize our uh, Vice Chairman, Mr. Scott. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Kamal, I want to talk to ask you about the licensing delays. Um, uh, how have licensing delays and the increasing backlog of pending applications affected the management of defense programs with our key allies and partners? Well, uh, they have contributed to uh, a number of complaints from our, uh, from our key partners that uh, we've, uh, we've moved to address in a number of ways. As you may know, since uh, 2004, uh, it has been uh, the, uh, the law to provide expedited uh, licensing to our British and Australian uh, partners. And uh, that system, uh, we believe, is, is working. We're constantly trying to uh, improve it to reduce the number of, uh, of, of, uh, of referrals that we need to make to the Defense Department and other agencies in administering, uh, administering that, uh, th th that part of the program. Uh, we've also run into problems. For example, we mm -hmm. have uh, for many years had a general uh, exemption uh, for uh, countries that are participating in the Joint Strike Fighter uh, program. Uh, that has not worked very well, though, because the primary users uh, to whom we issue the licenses have been unwilling or unable to guarantee that their subsidiaries and their contractors whom they employ uh, would be able to um, uh, w would also respect the, uh, the the restrictions that we put on. Do you have any examples of that? A specific example within the Joint Strike Fighter? Yeah, with the subsidiary, uh, who they might be. I, mean. I, I, I can't remember a specific example of a, a particular country right now, but I could get that for you and provide okay. that to you or your staff, sir. Okay, uh, if who, who would you refer to as uh, our key U.S. allies and partners? Wh what nations fall into that category? Certainly Great Britain, uh, Australia, Japan, uh, all of the members of NATO as our primary alliance, uh, members of the European Union who are not uh, uh, in NATO, many of those are, are partners as well. Uh, we have as a, a requirement a prohibition against uh, selling certain of our uh, materials, information, our platforms to foreign governments. Um, for example, like our F-22s. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there's a there's one side that says uh, we don't want we, we we do not want anything to jeopardize our air superiority. Our superiority. There's certain of our platforms that. Uh, we don't need to put on the market. And then there's the other side that says, well, maybe we should, it's a market, maybe there are lies. W what are your thoughts on that? Should I just, uh, my, my thoughts and I'd are like to get the, the thoughts of your, your, the other on that as well. Okay. No, my thoughts are that we have an obligation when we have an important military uh, ally or partner like Japan, for example, to work very closely in making sure that both sides bring the resources and the capabilities that they that we need to defend each other and to look out for each other's interests. And Japan's actually a very good example because, as you may know, Japan has been very interested in acquiring the F-22, uh, but U.S. law forbids providing the F-22 uh, to, uh, uh, to to any of our foreign partners. Uh, so, working within the law, uh, I believe uh, certainly the Pacific Command uh, I know has a very uh, productive dialogue with our Japanese partners in assessing what their uh, defense requirements are if they can't get the F-22. And I, I think we're able to work within those restrictions uh, well. That doesn't mean key partners do demand uh, some of our most sensitive technology uh, when we can't provide it to them uh, because of the law or because of our own need to protect ourselves. Uh, we certainly work very closely with the militaries in devising alternatives that are within the law. Okay. Uh, and I'd like to get your response to that, too, if I have time, but I, I did want to follow up on my earlier part of my question. 
Has the administration heard from our key allies or our coalition partners expressing either support for or concern about the U.S. export licensing uh, process? Uh, Congressman, I think the most graphic example would be uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we uh, perhaps the, the biggest source of concern out of all of our partners have come from the British in recent years. And in response to that concern and in recognition of the key role they play as our, uh, as our partner around the world, uh, President Bush signed with uh, then Prime Minister Blair uh, a new treaty that we hope the Senate will ratify uh, to greatly ease the process of defense cooperation. So uh, we, we hope that that will work not only as a good model in providing the, our British allies uh, what they need to work with us, but also re to reduce the workload on our operation and contribute to our efficiency. Okay. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, could, you re could I get a response from the two of you on the prohibition language on uh, the other nations, if I could? Do you agree with that? We're okay. Well, I think, uh, sir, what I guess I would say on that is is that there are certain uh, technologies where it's important for the United States to have a technological advantage. Uh, and in the case of the particular system that you mentioned, uh, that program really was not designed initially for export at all. Uh, but with programs like the Joint Strike Fighter program, I think it's an excellent model because what we've done is we've taken a very <laughs> advanced system, uh, basically a fifth generation aircraft that has very similar technology. We've brought international partners in at the early stages of that, and they're working closely with us to develop that program. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon us because we do want to have and work with allies around the world. We are really looking now to think about capabilities and making them basically think about export and the fact that we will share that technology with other countries. And we're trying to do that in uh, really early stages of our program development. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manzullo. Back in the early spring of 1993, when I was a freshman, I invited a young man by the name of Chris Padilla, uh, who was in the private sector uh, to come to my office and to begin the instruction uh, of exactly what dual use technology is. And that, that conversation has continued. And my questions have continued. And I maybe someday I'll get it, Chris. But I hope uh, my answers are getting better. Uh, so. They are. They are. But we're both getting more gray hair on it. And I like your toys better than mine. I'd be glad to exchange them. <laughs> um, the, um, but uh, since EA has expired, uh, my understanding is that the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA, uh, has been continuing the EAA in force. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. Um, under the EAA as drafted in 1979 and as amended, I understand that 17C expressly places previously FAA certified parts and components under your agency's jurisdiction. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. And do you think that the law in any way is unclear? Uh, no, sir. The President's Executive Order uh, number 13222, which directs us under IEPA to continue the EAA in force, uh, says that to the extent permitted by law, the provisions of the EAA um, shall be carried out under this order so as to continue in full force and effect. And that is what we have tried to do, sir. Uh, obviously, these questions are leading to another question. And, and uh, then why, why are manufacturers in the congressional district I represent are telling me that 17C is not being applied? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Chairman, um, this is black letter law. Uh, the provision of the EAA is quite clear, uh, and the provision of the executive order is quite clear. Uh, what the EAA says is that the part has to be certified by the FAA and be an integral part of civil aircraft. What we are trying to do, working with our interagency colleagues, is to provide more guidance to exporters and, frankly, to our licensing officers on what that means. What does it mean to be type certified? Uh, what does it mean to be integral to civil aircraft? And most importantly, could we give a list of exactly what kinds of aircraft we mean? You know, Boeing 737 Type 200 or, and so forth. Uh, so from our point of view, uh, there's no question as to the, the, uh, the intent of Congress and the intent of the President. Uh, I would add, though, sir, we have not had, as far as I know, very many commodity jurisdiction cases that have explicitly raised this question, uh, at least not yet. Let me take a look at, at your toys and my toys. And 
um, for, for every 100 applications uh, for license, um, I didn't mean to bring it up here, but I, I'm thrilled with, you know, I, li I live for objects like this. Um, but for every 100 licenses applied for, yes. uh, how many of those would be represented by items like this that obviously uh, should not be controlled? Well, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, of the uh, 19,000 or so licenses we do a year, uh, I believe that uh, if the proposal that uh, we're talk that I was talking about to remove these low-end thermal imaging cameras were uh, to be implemented, that I think we might take as many as 1,500 licenses a year out of our system right there. If we implement our validated end-user program, <coughs> uh, trusted customer program, where we <coughs> remove license requirements for customers who we know, we've done intelligence checks, it's the same stuff year after year after year, uh, that could be several hundred more licenses. So I would hope that we might reverse the trend that we've seen in commerce where the number's been going up about 15% a year, I, but those are probably the best estimates I can give you. And then another question is when we have something as simple as uh, this fiber optic cable, which is really a wiring harness, uh, which has many applications, how does something like this end up being on the ITAR list in the first place? I think I'll defer to my Anybody colleague. know? I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take that question. Okay. Uh, your, your example. You can even answer it if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to answer okay. it. Um, <laughs> of course, your, the examples that you showed are very, very compelling, and it does suggest that maybe these, uh, uh, on the surface, ap appear that these decisions might be made capriciously or without very much thought. But in fact, the ITAR is very much driven by, by parts, by things. And so when something goes on the ITAR, list, it's because it is useful in a particular part. So that, I'm not familiar with that particular piece of equipment, but one could imagine a situation in which that that specific wire fits exactly on an F-14. Uh, yeah, but F you know what? If, which if, are only used if by If you Iran. put the longer version on it also, it'll still fit with just a little bit of slack. But if a piece of equipment is designed for an airplane, a, a fighter plane, that in today's world only Iran is using, we, we have an obligation, uh, according to our interpretation of the law, uh, to, uh, to restrict that. But that's the problem. I mean, this is, this is bread and butter stuff. I mean, this is Radio Shack stuff. And I mean, this is the stuff that's, that's made in America, and, that, and, and these manufacturers really don't know how to sell this. I mean, I, I, I cannot, I can't defend what you just said. I really can't. Because this is not controlled at all. This is. Take out one inch and it fits. Can you explain that? But if that the one that is shorter or, or longer uh, is designed only for use in sensitive military technology that our enemies No, that's just use. that's just the length of it. I mean, it's the same. This is the same thing, designed for use. You measure off, and you put it in there. If you want to get, uh, you know, you could just snip off an inch here and just move it up. I mean, this is, this is the problem. I mean, this is why there's so much angst in the industry. I can't see how you can defend this, Ambassador. I, mean, I just, for the life of me, it, it's the same thing. What happens if it's on a spool that's 100 <laughs> feet long? What do you do in that case? Well, again, sir, we, we look at the item. If it is designed specifically for use in, in sensitive equipment, we, we believe the law requires us to, to regulate. I don't think that's the case at all. I think if it's something, number one, that's not readily available, and number one, that's so sophisticated that, it could, that, that if it falls into the hands of the enemy, I mean, the enemy can go out there and buy this and take off one inch. So then why should this be regulated. Well, every, let's take aircraft for an example. No, 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 answer the question. Uh, this, this will have to be your last question. Yeah. If, if the enemy can go out and buy this that's an inch longer than this, and which the enemy can shorten by one inch, then why should this be regulated? We, we uh, sir, we have the capability of, uh, we, we don't have, the, every civilian aircraft has millions of parts uh, to it, so we have to, 
look at what's designed for a specific aircraft that might be sensitive, that might be used by our enemies. And if, if something is designed for that, you know, it, can somebody work around and, and jimmy up something? Yes, they, uh, they could, but I don't think you're suggesting that we expand our regulations. No, I, exp I, I would suggest that you decrease your regulations. I mean, this is, I, yeah. you know, I appreciate your attempt at answering, the, the, uh, Mr. Mr. Bessler, Mr. Mr. but I think that goes to the problem. Thank you. I will point out that at least we're protecting our customers from buying the F-14 part by mistake and then getting one that's an inch too short and thinking that America doesn't produce good uh, aircraft parts. I hope that <laughs> our, uh, I hope that our customers around the country <laughs> are protected from buying a part uh, which, uh, uh, fits only in an airplane that they're not operating. With that, let's turn but to Mr. Will Tancredo. It, will the gentleman yield for just a minute? I will yield. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, if the gentleman, thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I think part of the problem is the focus, uh, instead of, of uh, stigmatizing nuclear weapons and wondering about what's happened on the AQCon network and how we missed that and how we missed uh, the um, technology being transferred from Europe, which was used frankly, to make atom bombs for various countries, or they, they were in the process of doing it. Iran is still in the process of doing it with his technology. Uh, I just think you've got a balance here, uh, and, and that's hard for bureaucracies to do, but the focus should be on the nuclear weapons and um, on, on things that can really hurt us. And somehow, you're going to have to do the calculus internally uh, to do that. And and that's, I think, your charge, and that should be part of our oversight. Thank, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Padilla, uh, the, it, it has come to our attention just recently that the, un the United Nations um, Development Program has um, transferred dual-use technology uh, to North Korea, uh, technology and, and uh, equipment that they, uh, I, as I understand, originally applied for uh, uh, permission to, uh, to obtain and uh, I mean they applied to obtain and we denied that, um, which I'm so glad to hear. They then obtained it somehow. I, nobody's quite sure, as I understand it, exactly how they got it and has now been, we, we recognize that it has been used, it is being used. Uh, by the North Koreans. This includes uh, very sensitive GPS equipment, uh, some very high-end um, uh, uh, portable spec spectrometers, and a large quantity of high-specification computer hardware. Um, what happened? Do we have any idea what happened? And what is, I guess, what can we do about the fact that the United Nations <laughs> is involved with shipping dual use material to our enemy? Well, I'll tell you what we know right now, sir, and what we're working to find out and investigating. Uh, uh, what we know is that uh, apparently the UN Development Program did ship uh, a number of items, as you described, um, to uh, a project uh, in North Korea. Right. Uh, we, uh, we know that those items were shipped uh, and, and are not under the control of the UNDP in North Korea. Uh, what we do not know uh, with any specificity yet is exactly what the technical specifications of all those items were and whether they would have required a Commerce Department license or not. I thought the, uh, that they had, they, had they had applied and you turned they, it down. They did apply and uh, there were some applications in I believe it was 1999. That's correct. Uh, for equipment that clearly did need a license and was denied. What we don't know about the most recent shipments, sir, which I understand took place, I believe, within the last year, is whether the technical specifications of that equipment was such that it would have been on the commerce control list and required a license. Uh, what we also don't know is whether the equipment was U.S. origin and therefore subject to our jurisdiction, whether it was bought in the United States and shipped from here or whether it had U.S. parts and components that would make it subject to our regulations. Uh, we are working closely with the State Department and the U.S. mission to the United Nations, uh, including uh, Ambassador uh, Khalilzad and Ambassador Wallace, uh, to learn more about the details of these transactions, and then we will take uh, appropriate action. I think it's clear at a minimum, and we have asked to do this, that we, that we talk with the UNDP and ensure that they understand what our regulations <laughs> and the law require. Yes, I think that's an excellent uh, idea. I think that 
we should probably expand that to, to any other department of the United Nations that is actually obtaining this. I mean, it's a strange thing anyway, in a way, to, to uh, hear that a, a part of the United Nations requiring the, uh, requesting this, this kind of equipment um, and, and then, of course, finding out that it has fallen into the hands of the North Koreans and that there were North Koreans that were actually working in the uh, agency itself. And they, they lied about that in their first response, as I'm told, said that they were none. Later we found out that that was true. It is quite disconcerting, and I hope that it's something that uh, people in, in the com in commerce and state are paying a great deal of attention to. Thank you. The last question I have deals with, uh, I think it was Ambassador Mull, your comments with regard to uh, the, 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 a change of focus away from country to consumer. Um, of the products so that we, because it's no longer, you know, the Cold War situation where a country is the, I don't remember if it was Mr. I think Stia, that was Mr. Stia, excuse me, and uh, <laughs> which is certainly understandable and commendable. Uh, the question arises a situation where, for instance, our ally, in this case Great Britain, uh, requests or, or attempts to purchase something from the United States uh, that, um, and does in fact obtain materials that we would agree to provide with a close ally or to a close ally and um, then we you recognize that they that the EU inside the EU which now has a ban on all uh, shipments of this kind of material to China as do we but you recognize that inside the EU there's this now this restlessness about that and the possibility that that would be overturned and so we then have you know provided something to an ally it's also part of the EU, which then in turn ends up uh, <laughs> shipping it to China. I mean, what do we do about that? Uh, yes, sir, that's a very good question. And uh, in fact, we're refining, we're developing the answer to it uh, in our current negotiations with the British. We're in the process of coming up uh, with the implementation regulations that would accompany the treaty if the Senate does provide its uh, consent uh, to it. But our thinking is that uh, the best way to do that is to put restrictions on the supplies that we would provide to Great Britain under the terms of the treaty uh, so that it would enjoy the official protection of the British Official Secrets Act and w could not be re-exported or transferred away from the original user of this uh, service uh, without certainly the permission of the United States. So uh, we will be sure to implement controls so that the scenario you describe, which is a real unfortunate possibility, uh, that that would not happen. Thank you very much. I have no other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ambassador Mull, I'm told the F-14 is uh, flown by only uh, one country in the world, that's Iran. Do you allow, allow any exports of any part uh, used exclusively on F-14? No. Good. Uh, we've got these turf battles. Um, can, have you gentlemen tried to sit down and just work it out? Well, I, I, I mean, you guys could sit down for a couple hours and issue a memorandum of understanding that would identify exactly uh, the answers to all these uh, turf battle questions we keep hearing. Uh, in fact, I think that's an excellent suggestion, and our agencies are in the process of coming up with a better way uh, of doing this. Well, could, I hope you could get it done the next week. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it would take longer, except this is the federal government, but there are circumstances where you disagree. Mrs. McCormick, are you willing to act as referee when they can't reach an agreement? Sir, I'd be more than glad to perform that. Okay, role, good. And uh, then uh, I know they'll report back uh, a week from now that they've reached full agreement on a number of things and on the rest, you know, uh, give uh, Mull a couple, give Padilla a couple, and you're done with your work. Uh, yes, Padilla. Mr. Chairman, I would say, uh, specifically with regard to the issue that is most often contentious between us, and that is mm -hmm. commodity jurisdiction. Does, does the product that uh, Mr. Manzullo was holding mm -hmm. up belong under commerce's control or state's control? I think we have made some improvements recently. Um, for example, by having more regular meetings between commerce and state officials there to There shouldn't be a single product where industry doesn't know who has control except in circumstances where the product was invented in the last few weeks or months. Um, these folks all can, can list uh, the products, and, and you do have a circumstance now where 
the decision is being made. It's just being made by the exporter and not by the government, uh, which is not the way we want to have these decisions made. So uh, you can say, oh, we're making progress, oh, we'll get together. Uh, these are the kinds of disputes which in the private sector, two subsidiaries of the same parent corporation would work out in a week. Why, why can't you come back to us when we come back for the August recess and say for every single commodity identified uh, as a, a, a one where there is some question as to jurisdiction, you've come up with the answer? What I would just suggest, Mr. Chairman, is the way that we work our licensing system I actually think provides a good model for what you're talking about. We have licenses, for example, 20,000 a year in commerce. We refer them out to all of these agencies. Sometimes defense disagrees and they don't think we should approve it and we have a dispute. What we have, however, in the licensing process is a very clear dispute resolution system with timelines. So by a certain number of days, if defense hasn't gotten their views in, it's deemed approved. If there is a dispute, it goes to a, a, an interagency committee that I chair. We have a certain number of days to make mm -hmm. a decision. It then, works then, pretty then well. Then how come there are certain items where you've had disputes for years? Because we don't have a similar system for then commodity Then why don't you get one? Mrs. McCormick is great. She'll just decide these things very quickly for you. Uh, and uh, we'll solve the problem. Um, Again, in, pri in, in private fields, you wouldn't have two subsidiaries of the same parent corporation uh, uh, running these disputes. Uh, for, for each of uh, the two operating agencies, Mr. Mo uh, and uh, Mr. Padilla, how many uh, applications do you have that you uh, are more than 120 days old where you haven't said yes or no yet? Right now? Yeah. Give me your best guess. Or it's 567 that have not been resolved, that are beyond 60 days. 567. Uh, Mr. Padilla, how many you got that are uh, old and cold? I could probably count them on the fingers of two hands. We have a... a Without a, taking off your shoes? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we, have a, we have an executive order that, operate, that we operate under the commerce licensing system that requires and actually puts an outside deadline of 90 days. And as you can see, our average is about 30 days. So to have something 120 days, the only, uh, the, the only case I could think of would be one that was pending at very senior interagency levels, uh, okay. perhaps to a terrorist country or something like Why that. Why does your average licensing officer only complete 408 applications a year, which sounds like a lot, uh, when is. the State Department is able to do three times as many per licensing officer? Well, we have fewer license applications, uh, but we, we have um, the appropriate, I believe, the appropriate number of staff if you think about 408 applications, that's more than one a so, day per so licensing. So your argument is you're not overstaffed, he's understaffed. Uh, I don't think the Commerce Department is overstaffed. I think we're adequately staffed, and I think if you asked our customers who are exporters of dual-use goods, they would generally say that the Commerce system works well. Well, sh uh, just between you and me, he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Should he... Do you think the State Department can process 1,700 applications per licensing officer and do it well? I think it's a lot, sir. I don't think, uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think the State Department has sufficient resources to do the job. Um, recognize the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is it the Department of Commerce uh, which uh, uh, regulates uh, computer exports? Yes, sir, by and large. By and large, okay. Uh, this, was, this was years ago, uh, but uh, I, I remember a controversy about uh, which computers are exportable, which computers are not exportable, and which fall sort of in the gray zone of, shall we say, requires a little time to consider. Yes. Uh, where are we currently in uh, in, in setting uh, those um, those uh, 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 those uh, lines for delineation uh, in terms of uh, computation speed, uh, the current computational speed limit is uh, zero point seven five weighted teraflops, uh, and I hope you don't ask me to explain what a weighted teraflop is, sir. 
What I can tell you is that it, it, it basically, that's the multilateral control level for most countries. It's a little bit lower for terrorist supporting countries. Uh, but what we generally issue licenses for in computers now are essentially supercomputers, like IBM Blue Gene uh, supercomputer mainframe equipment. And we do a handful of those a year. It's, uh, it's certainly not uh, laptops or desktops or things that you could buy online. Is there a different way, and just think with me for a moment, uh, is there a different way of regulating computer exports other than regulating uh, tariff laws? Well, um, for many years, there was a different control metric uh, called MTOPS, millions of theoretical operations per second. Some people may remember it. Uh, and every other year or so, uh, the administration would have to raise that level because of Moore's law and the technology moving so quickly. Well, uh, we, let, we let, 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 let me, let me re-guide you because I, I, what I'm trying to encourage, uh, at least try to explore with you, I is whether uh, there is an approach to this which is other than computational speed or crunch power, whether there is, th there is a way of delineating architecture mm -hmm. uh, uh, hardware, software, architecture that w we want uh, wh where we can uh, do a workaround on, on, on this raw speed. Right. Well, I think we certainly are open to, to working with industry. Uh, we know the types of machines that we're concerned about and we know why. Uh, we have come up with this weighted teraflop measure, which is relatively new because we think it's a better way that won't require us to change those computational speed limits every other year. Uh, if the industry has suggestions that have to do with architecture or even with end users, uh, I think m my colleagues and I would be certainly open to them, yeah, but I candidly, sir, we that, haven't come up with one. Yeah, yet. I haven't hear heard that suggestion from, from industry. No. And when I've discussed this with some other folks, there, there have been uh, some specific problems raised. Uh, and I, uh, since you know, you're the regulator, if you will, uh, I, I wanted to probe this with you about whether you have considered uh, ways of um, ways of regulating these exports. Uh, w that is, shall we say, a little bit, bit more intellectually elegant than um, uh, measuring computer speed. Uh, and and you know, I'll, I'll, g I'll give you two concerns about this. Uh, one is. Uh, the administrative burden, if you will, and you've, you've tried to work around that uh, with the weighted teraflop rather than uh, the, the prior approach. Uh, but, you know, a more interesting question to me is, well, gee, you know, if the limit is today 0.75 weighted teraflops, mm -hmm. shoot, 10 years ago, uh, the limit might have been 0.10 weighted teraflops, and uh, as an intellectual matter, if a computer that could do 0.50 weighted teraflops <laughs> was dangerous five years ago, what makes it safe today? It's a reasonable inquiry. I know commercial de demands change, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that there are some problems with measuring these things, uh, me measuring, uh, y using the metric that, that, that you all have been using. Uh, and you know, the, the, the inquiry is, is there a conceptually different sure. paradigm? I, I think we are, we are open to consider different paradigms. We recently published a notice in the Federal Register uh, calling for input from industry or academia or others on a comprehensive review of the Commerce Control List. The weighted teraflop measure was developed with extensive input from industry and computer experts to try to take architecture into account. I, I think, sir, uh, we are very open to considering uh, the, the more elegant types of intellectual approaches. Uh, we have not yet found one uh, that we think is better than weighted teraflops, uh, and I think that the weighted teraflops has succeeded in, in sharpening the focus of the control pretty well. We're no longer running into the problem of the laptop that you can buy at Radio Shack bumping up against the control limit. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
been suggested by Mr. Menzullo that you send uh, this subcommittee a report, a uh, status report every month on uh, your up uh, backlog, and uh, I think that would be a good idea. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure in terms of defining what, how you would define the backlog. We're, we're, we're certainly eager to communicate with you and communicate our progress. Uh, to I would say average processing time and number of applications that are more than 120 days old or more than 60 days old. Uh, I'll have to check with our legislative affairs, but personally, I, I, it sounds like a fine idea. Okay. Otherwise, I can always call you and ask uh, if they won't let you issue something in writing, and then I can share that with uh, other interested members of Congress. I want to thank the first panel and move on to the second panel. Our first witness is uh, Ms. Barr, uh, Director uh, in the Acquisition and Sourcing Management Team of the GAO, now known as the Government Accountability Office. As an old CPA, I like your old name better. In any case, in this capacity, she oversees the review of technology transfers, international management, and defense supplier base and contract management. Uh, Ms. Barr. extensive body of work has shown that export control programs and related processes have for the most part been neglected. This raises serious questions about the government's ability to protect defense related items while allowing le legitimate trade to occur. GAO has made numerous recommendations on ways to improve both the effectiveness and efficiency of the system, but a lack of action or fix fixes that were not grounded and an analysis of the problems have left the system even more vulnerable. These deficiencies, in part, prompted GAO to add to its 07 high-risk list the effective pr protection of technologies critical to U.S. interests. Today I will focus on three key areas, questionable program effectiveness, 
concerns regarding efficiency, and an overall lack of management due diligence. The first area concerns weaknesses that relate to the most basic aspects of the export control system. That is jurisdictional control and clarity on the use of licensing exemptions. Regarding jurisdictional control, state and commerce continue to debate which department controls the export of certain sensitive items. For some items, including certain missile-related technologies, both departments have claimed jurisdiction. For other items, such as night vision technology and explosive detection equipment, commerce improperly claimed control, making the items subject to less restrictive export control requirements. Unless and until these disputes are resolved, it is ultimately the exporter, not the government, who determines what level of governmental review and control will follow. A lack of clear guidance on exemption use has further limited the government's ability to ensure that exports comply with laws and regulations. Clear guidance is critical for exporters as they are the ones responsible for ensuring the legitimacy of license exempt exports. However, state has provided conflicting information to exporters on exemption use, which has, in some cases, harmed U.S. interests. For an example, an exporter was incorrectly informed by state that a planned shipment of items to support NATO training exercises was not eligible for an exemption. Therefore, the exporter canceled the shipment and the training exercises were called off. These weaknesses also create considerable challenges for other players, namely the enforcement community. Without information as fundamental as what items are controlled and which need, an, and which need a license, enforcement officials are limited in their ability to carry out their respective inspection, investigation, and prosecution responsibilities. The second area concerns inefficiencies in the export licensing process. Clearly, reviews of export license applications require careful deliberation. However, licensing decisions should not be delayed due to process inefficiencies, nor should licensing requirements be bartered for efficiency. While state has initiated various efforts to improve its license application processing times, these initiatives have generally not been successful. In fact, median processing times doubled in four years, and as was mentioned in the first panel, state reached an all-time high of over 10,000 open application cases. Quite frankly, this grim trend is not surprising to us. When state announced many of its initiatives in 2000, we cautioned then Without an analysis of underlying problems, any initiative that state would develop to achieve efficiencies would at best be a shot in the dark. Although most commerce-controlled exports can occur without a license, it is no less important for commerce to seek efficiencies where needed. Yet the overall efficiency of the department's licensing process is unknown, in part <coughs> due to its limited assessments. The third and final area concerns a more fundamental issue, state and commerce's lack of due diligence in assessing the overall effectiveness of their systems. Neither department has conducted a thorough assessment of their system, yet both argue <coughs> that no fundamental changes are needed. Making this determination without basis is risky business. In conclusion, our work has repeatedly demonstrated that the U.S. export control system is in desperate need of repair. Redefine security threats, changing allied relationships, and increasing globalization, coupled with the numerous weaknesses we have identified, demand that the U.S. government step back, assess, and rethink the current system's ability to protect multiple U.S. interests. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to answer any questions that you or other subcommittees may have. Thank you. Thank you. I should point out that copies of this wonderful chart prepared by my staff, the testimony of our witnesses, and uh, what I guess I would refer to as a GAO report being issued today are all available uh, at the table on the side. Um, with that, uh, let's go on to our next uh, witness, uh, Mr. Lowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have submitted a uh, 
prepared statement, so just and summarize my views. Be, uh, before I let you proceed, let me indicate that uh, Mr. Lowell is Managing Director of Lowell Defense Trade LLC, which advises U.S. and uh, European firms on export uh, control compliance. He headed the State Department's Office of Defense Trade Controls uh, for virtually a decade, from 1994 till 2003. And most impressively of all, uh, he's a former staffer to the <laughs> Foreign Affairs Committee. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes. First of all, um, the basic system we have for arms export control is sound. That's the statutory system. The problem, in my opinion, lies in three areas, and it has to do with the administration of the licensing system, or in some cases, the lack of proper administration. But there are three things I want to just focus on today briefly. Two of them have already been discussed, and I won't dwell on them. Uh, one is the GAO designation of this system as a high-risk area. This is really a flashing red light uh, that, that needs to be addressed with uh, some sense of urgency in an across-the-board way. Uh, this is just the most inopportune time to have all of these vulnerabilities and risks to our system out there in such a documented way. So I applaud your involvement, Mr. Chairman, in, in making sure that uh, this is given proper attention, and also that of Mr. Lantus, whose statement I thought was very encouraging. Uh, the second thing is the, the impact of the license delays is really taking a toll, not just on the economic and commercial interests of the companies and uh, the interests of our allies and their companies and interoperability matters and so forth. It affects compliance with our laws and our regulations in an across-the-board way because of the delays and frustrations and uncertainty. And our system really is the, s the, the sort of centerpiece of what happens internationally in export controls. The United States system is the high watermark. If we expect other countries to cooperate and strengthen controls where we need them to, to go along with our controls and, and respect, uh, respect and enforce them, uh, then we need to be able to administer our system efficiently and generate the support for compliance with it. The third thing uh, relates somewhat to GAO's finding, but it, but it is a separate issue. It's important enough that I, I, uh, I think it needs to be raised, and that is, as alluded to by Ms. Calvary Barr, there has been no systematic evaluation in the post-9-11 environment of either the Commerce System or the State Department System. This is probably the only area of U.S. government national security policy that hasn't been assessed for weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And the agencies have asserted, uh, mostly as an article of faith rather than rigorous assessment, uh, that changes aren't needed. But, but in fact, this is a, a very dangerous situation the United States is in now. We need to look at these regulations. We need to see if additional authorities are needed and see if there are particular areas that we need to focus on. And I think it's important to remember in this respect, we're not only talking about weapons going abroad and falling into dangerous hands and then coming back to be used against us. These laws and regulations also are an important means by which we control the transfer of defense articles in the United States to foreign persons and the import, temporary import in particular, of weapon systems from other countries. So at the current time, we have in the regulations a situation where U.S. government approval is required for the transfer of a communi commercial communication satellite to a foreign person. But the same regulations don't require a license for the transfer of biological weapons to a foreign person. <coughs> or harbor entrance detection equipment or other things controlled on the munitions list that we know are of interest to terrorist groups and al-Qaeda in particular. So I would urge, Mr. Chairman, that the subcommittee also put this part of the problem on its agenda uh, it involves a bigger audience than just state commerce and defense. It involves the law enforcement communities, justice, FBI, the intelligence agencies, and so forth, to make sure we have a, 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 an adequate and effective assessment and solve and address any areas of risk and vulnerability that are related directly to the terrorist threat at this time. And I thank you, sir. That uh, you're one of the few witnesses not to use his entire allocated time. That does not mean Mr. Douglas gets six minutes. Let's hear from Mr. Douglas for five. And I should point out that Mr. Douglas is here. We welcome him. He is president and CEO of the Aerospace Industries Association. He is a former assistant secretary of the Navy 
for research, development, and acquisition of defense systems for the United States Navy and the Marine Corps. Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to uh, join my colleagues and thank you for having this important hearing. Um, uh, this indeed is an area where we need some structural changes in the way our government operates. I would add, uh, sir, in addition to being uh, former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, I'm also a former uh, general officer in the Air Force, a NATO commander, uh, a member of the National Security Council staff, and a member of the congressional staff. So I've seen this issue from a lot of different uh, viewpoints, and my uh, uh, point the, the, today. The highest ranking of all being that former congressional staffer. Yes, sir, right. <laughs> Most powerful of all, uh, for sure. Um, uh, I would also ask, sir, with your permission, to have my written statement entered into the record. If Without objection, all written statements will be <coughs> made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Lantos's a letter of invitation asked me to speak broadly on the impact of U.S. laws, regulations, policies, and practice, uh, the impact that these have on the United States uh, industry's ability to sell, sell its products overseas. And I think the place to uh, begin to put this in some perspective, sir, is to uh, sort of describe the span of where all of these laws uh, take place. On the one end of the spectrum is purely civil equipment, which is generally not regulated at all. Then there's dual use civil equipment. Then there's civil equipment that is modified uh, for military use. Then there is military equipment, which is unclassified and then there is military equipment which is classified um, by our classification system. And generally speaking, sir, we don't have problems on either end of the spectrum. Uh, the industry uh, clearly is, has no problem in understanding how classified material is dealt with and the products that are manufactured as a result of that system of how we license and uh, export those. It's in this middle area of dual use civil equipment, of civil modified equipment, and incidentally, the things that Mr. Manzulu held up were uh, uh, civil items which had been modified. In other words, they just made it an inch longer to go in a military airplane, uh, or uh, I think an inch, inch shorter, shorter uh, to go in a military airplane. And then there's military unclassified, and there's all kinds of things that are in our military equipment today. and. It's really important uh, to note, sir, that that, that uh, material, the drawings and the, and the specifications for that equipment and so on, since it's not classified, it is not controlled by our military. In other words, you could go on a military base, and Mr. Scott, you have uh, military bases in your district. Uh, uh, you would find that that's just sitting around a file cabinet. They don't even have to lock it up. It doesn't go in the safe because it's not classified. It's just specifications for screws, bolts, tubes, uh, wires like you just saw today, widely available on the internet all through. Uh, industry is often asked to write uh, specifications for that kind of equipment. It's not classified. It's not controlled. So you asked me, uh, what is the impact? Well, first of all, uh, there's a huge impact in jobs lost. Um, in my part of the industry that I represent, and I should also add, sir, that I'm here today representing the Coalition uh, for Security and Competitiveness. There are 18 different associations in that uh, coalition. But just in the aerospace and defense area that I, I am involved in, we can see tens of thousands of jobs that are lost on an annual basis due to the current system. Uh, when you expand that to the whole national uh, manufacturing area, uh, many people believe that the number of jobs lost is in the hundreds of thousands versus tens of thousands. The financial impact is also large. It's uh, at least uh, in the range of billions, not millions, of lost business each year. Thirdly, um, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, there is a perverse impact of the current system in which we uh, sometimes create industries among our competitors overseas. We've seen this in the space business from time to time where we've put things on the uh, munitions list that are really commercial products and we create a uh, industry overseas. What causes these negative effects? Well, first of all, the law itself uh, is a potential cause. Uh, as we all know, these laws were all written back in the mid to late 1970s. 
Um, I usually have equipment like uh, Mr. Manzullo pointed out. Um, I could show you a bracket, for example, that's on the munitions list that's also on a John Deere tractor. It's exported all over the world. Um, regulations, uh, they generally follow the law. The, uh, uh, both the Commerce Department and the Department of State generally write regulations that uh, follow the law. So as the law goes, so go the regulations. When you get to the policies arena, we often see that the policies of administration from time to time go significantly beyond the law. Uh, th my colleagues at the table have mentioned the jurisdiction policies as one uh, area where they've gone way beyond the law. You, you, your comments are, are right on, sir. And clearly the practices of implementing these policies also go uh, far beyond the law. What can be done? We've made a number of uh, recommendations. They were alluded to by the ambassador uh, this uh, afternoon. Mr. Douglas, I'm going to have to make your statement part of the record, ask my colleagues uh, to ask one and only one question, and then we're going to have to go to the floor for what I'm told is roughly 10 votes. And I will not ask uh, you to stay here, so this hearing will, will end uh, quickly. Uh, my one question, Mr. Douglas, is if, God forbid, the only way to deal with the State Department backlog was to turn to industry and ask for them to pay one dollar out of every 10,000 for a licensed export. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That would generate... Uh, In general, sir, we, we don't like uh, uh, user fees for what we consider to be inherently government uh, functions. Uh, on the other hand, if it would solve the problem, we would probably gladly pay it. But we don't have high confidence it would solve the problem. You've seen some evidence of that yourself here uh, today. They tripled the fees and the length of time well, that went up. Clearly, if the fees are then hijacked by state or for other purposes, they wouldn't do any good. There has to be a maintenance of effort. Uh, I, and uh, with that, I turn it over to Mr. Royce for one question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, it's good to see Mr. Lowell with us. I want to commend him uh, for his testimony uh, and but also for the service he provided us before on this committee, and thank you, Mr. Lowell, for being with us. I was going to ask you, Mr. Lowell, for your views on the, uh, the U.S.-U.K. Defense Trade Treaty uh, that's been pr uh, proposed, and, and uh, also uh, you discussed the need really to bring a sense of urgency to some of the shortcomings that we've been talking about today, and I'd like you to further explain the need for urgent action. Uh, and what are the consequences? Mr. Mr. Lowell. Well, thank you, Mr. Roy Sant, for, uh, for your kind words. Uh, wh while you're out voting, there was actually just uh, one point I made about the urgency of that, which has to do with the need to look systematically at, at uh, potential threats that could be exploited from terrorists, terrorist organizations, and our current regulations. Need for a systematic examination of that. I also think that the uh, growing backlog creates multiple national security problems in, in countless ways and unforeseen ways. Uh, there's a lot of important things in there that need to be adjudicated, and there are probably some things in there that shouldn't be adjudicated. So uh, while this backlog builds up, it, it, just, it just corrodes compliance throughout the industry. We depend on industry, the private sector, to make this all work. The government describes the regulations and parameters. Industry's got to carry it out. So. It, it's just a recipe for problem if it continues to go on. With, with respect to the UK treaty, I'd, I'd be reluctant on, on something so important to give you a sort of definitive view. I think that uh, uh, the fact that it is a treaty responds, uh, is responsive in part to one of the concerns that uh, uh, members of Congress had in the House at least uh, the last time around, and, and that's a good development. But I, I think we'll have to wait to see the details to see whether this is really uh, uh, another part of a broader strategy to decontrol the arms export control system, or whether it's really a, a, a well-designed way to safeguard our interests in, in a different fashion. I think we just have to see the details. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. I appreciate that. Mr. Scott. Well, thank you. <coughs> I'd, I'd like to just uh, t take, take a look, uh, have each of you just comment for a moment on, given our, our the state of uh, the world now, the terrorism, um, and some of our problems with Iran and others. The I asked earlier about who our allies and who our partners were for a reason, because 
I think that there, there is an enormous loophole in um, how we deal with other nations with our um, the, the, the technical information and aspects of our weaponry, especially, for example, we have alliances with countries that might have alliances and partnerships with countries that we don't have. So it seems to me that there is a loophole here, that there is a problem here, and I'm wondering how we address that. I think that's one of the reasons why we got into the mess in Iraq that we're in, because, because we weren't sure what information was getting to countries we were dealing with and other countries were dealing with, who we found out were dealing with Iraq. So we just didn't have any way of knowing what solid intelligence was. And I was wondering, where would we tighten um, our export controls, uh, and where do you see the loopholes? I notice in your testimony, I think you referred to that, Mr. Lowell, and I think, Ms. Barr, you used the word neglect. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could respond to that um, We've been told in the vote would be at 5.30. They would be for cutting the item short. Sure, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to respond. I think uh, part of the, the issue here is that it's really important for the U.S. export control agencies to be fully aware of what the other countries export controls policies and procedures are going forward because clearly then you can define a what needs to be controlled and b how we have to control it if we license things we have to be able to license <coughs> them with certain conditions and provisos and we have to be able to have access to check and make sure that the export that did eventually go out is being used as intended and i am not confident based on the work that we've done that we have that kind of sophisticated or comprehensive intelligence gathering to know the repercussions of some of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Long. Um, <coughs> well, Mr. Scott, I mentioned a few uh, with respect to the the, um, the gaps and, and weaknesses. I mentioned a few a few moments ago with respect to internal United States transfers to foreign persons, where there's no there's no con no coverage under the Arms Export Control Act. So we have a control on a commercial commsat, but not on biological weapons. That seems to me to be something that should be updated. Other things might be uh, exemptions we have in the regulations. For example, it's still it's still the case that anybody enter coming from the United States, coming from Canada, can temporarily import any munitions item. Any foreign person can temporarily import any munitions item from Canada. I mean, we we've had problems with Canada. The Millennium Bomber came from Canada, and so it's not clear that. That shouldn't be restricted in some ways. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. All Chairman. All of our witnesses to add would never comment, and mm -hmm. they have to discuss questions for other places. Uh, for our record, uh, uh, sometime in the next uh, five minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, the floor call. Let's call three times.